Navy would do. The Navy would take the brightest, the sharpest, the most articulate sailors and they would make DC electricians. I just happen to be a DC electrician. <laughs> And I want to show you the main compartment that I worked in. It was an interesting compartment. It was one of the smallest ones in the submarine, but we actually controlled all of the submarine's power and directed the power. And we'll go into the maneuvering room and I'll show you what this is like. Well, this is the maneuvering room right here. As you can see, it looks complicated. We like to tell people it was complicated, but uh, it, it's just one of those things that we learned. Uh, we actually would charge. This is a diesel electric boat, which means that you have engines that are running motors. You have motors that are running generators, and we control all the speed. We would get the indication from the bridge, from the officer of the deck, the speed, and we would adjust the engines to the speed. We also charge the batteries from here. We control the engines. Um, by controlling the engines, we could start and shut down, mainly shut down the engines from inside this compartment. So we were the communications to the officer of the deck. Uh, all this uh, electric Componentry here just showed us the amperage, the charging we were doing, the amperage we were taking out of the batteries. On board this submarine we had two main batteries. When we were submerged, the batteries themselves were large. Each battery was one ton, it's about six foot high. We had 126 cells and we had two of them. So we had extremely large batteries in here. This was an extremely hot place. I'm standing on top of 200 or two 1500 horsepower electric motors. Uh, I would get extremely hot in this compartment. At times the temperatures would get up to 135 degrees on a continual basis. So we did not have many heavy guys working in here. You, you would start out in here and you would sweat a lot. We would come in here, we'd have a gallon jug of water and we'd drink a lot of water. So basically this was an extremely hot area. We've got bus bar, we've got motors, we've got all of our electric here in here. And what, it's just like the transmission on the car, okay? You would, instead of going from first gear to second gear, the third gear, you would go through a series of bus bars. To, uh, so you wouldn't immediately put all the power in the motors. So it would be like first gear, second gear, third gear. We had two separate motors. We had two operators back here. Looks complicated. Uh, it takes a while to learn, but once you learn it, you never forget it. You can see in here the bus bars that we have. All of this stuff does something that creates heat. And heat is what we had a lot of back here. We had to be able to work on this, and there's not a lot of room, especially when you got below flats to work. So I was at that time a slim trim, about 145 pounds, so six foot three. So you don't have a lot of big guys here because you have to be able to work around uh, and, and in some pretty tight areas. We had two Fairbanks Morris's and engines in this. Each one is 1,500 horsepower opposed pistons. Uh, they were running continually. Even under the water with the snorkel system, we could run these. Uh, the, the engine guys in this room, that was back in the days when we didn't have, they were here, the ear protectors, but a lot of guys didn't wear them. Most of the people of my era that I know are now either deaf or have hearing aids because if you're in here for days and weeks and months and some of these guys spent years in here, uh, it does affect the hearing. It was an extremely noisy and hot place, and what I want to do is just let you get an idea. We have Fairbanks Morris tapes and a system underneath the decks here that we can kind of give you an idea. But what you're missing is the heat, what you're missing is the vibration and the continual noise that was permeating these guys when they were in here. So here's kind of what it's like. would put up uh, for days and weeks and years at a time. 
Now, we had two engine rooms in this boat here. We had the after engine room with two uh, engines. This one had two engines. We were a three engine boat. Uh, we put a magical device in here in one of the uh, shipyards stops that we made called the bubble machine. And the Navy was always looking for anti-submarine uh, devices to put on here. And what this did, we had a shaft that ran down the uh, keel of the boat and we could turn this machine on and it would emit bubbles up the side of the submarine. And theoretically, what would happen when the enemy was trying to ping on you with sonars, it would hit those bubbles and wouldn't hit bare metals, and so consequently it would be more difficult to find us. It worked some of the time. It didn't work all of the times, and that's why it did not become a standard. Again, the same challenges in this room right here. We did manufacture our own water. Up here we had two 1,000 gallon stills. We made enough water to cook, to cool the engines, but we did not take showers at sea. That was a luxury. Um, that was all right. As long as we all smelt the same, that was all right. So that was one of the interesting things we had here. I want to point out one thing. Each submarine has their own battle record. This is what the World War II patch of the USS Razorback looked like. And the Razorback is a, was a white whale. All submarines during the Second World War were named after fish. And there was the trout and the tuna, there was the, the skate, but uh, we were called after a white whale, the Razorback. Not the pig that they think in the state of Arkansas, but we are a white whale. This is the configuration. This, this shows the ships that she sunk the uh, smaller ships that they sunk with the, the uh, top guns. Uh, during the end of the war, we had sunk most of the Japanese shipping at that particular time, and what we were used, what submarines were used for was lifeguard duty. They were using a lot of B-29s and B-17s to bomb Pearl Harbor, not Pearl Harbor, that bombed the Japanese cities, and a lot of these pilots were shot and had the ditch in the Pacific. This shows that we picked up five different ships. Uh, one of our presidents, uh, the first original general, our uh, President Bush, was picked up by a submarine when he was shot down in the Pacific. So we, we picked up some pretty famous people. Okay. I think there was about 800 in total that were picked up. This was our major cruise toilet. Uh, we did have four sinks in here, and this was for 66 guys. Uh, the officers did have their own head up in the front, but we basically shared these. You even had to qualify to use the toilet. What happens when you're 300 foot over or under the water and you try to expel this uh, fluid outside of the submarine? Well, if you don't do it properly, it'll come right back and smack you in the face. So the first thing we had, this is quite a complicated toilet. We would bring somebody in there and show them how to use the toilet. Because if he didn't, then trust me, the whole crew would go on him. Uh, we would have had two little showers on the back there that we would take a shower. We were uh, fortunate at the time we hit a port that we would take a shower. But uh, mainly in Japan or places like that, we just go over and get a hotel room or take a hot bath or something to get this caca off your system. So this is the main area. We're going to go back to the main sleeping compartment. Uh, we've got 48 bunks in this area. Um, many of these are hot bunking, and you've always got something going. A third of the crew is either on duty, a third of the crew is either working, or a third of the crew is either sleeping. So it's always active back there. This is the after batter area right here where most of us slept in this area right here. We did have some storage on these units and we could keep some stuff. The Navy uniforms were an interesting uniforms, both the blues and the whites. We did press and iron them in reverse. So consequently, you could take your uniforms, you could put them underneath your mattress, and you could press them. So even though you smelt terrible because the whole inside of this boat permeated of diesel oil, you look nice when you went ashore. Uh, you can see around the corner how we're crammed in there. Uh, we did not have 
a doctor on board these, but we had a pretty senior corpsman. And some of these guys actually perform appendectomies uh, at sea. I mean, they were pretty qualified senior corpsman guys, and, and they would fix broken bones and, and whatever it is, but they're pretty good boys. Okay.